So we're going to talk about how we built our redacted and not XOR badge this year. Um, oh, really? I should start with, can you hear me all right? Now we're golden. And feel free to come closer if you want to ask questions and whatnot. Um, so yeah, we're going to go over how we did our Anonyx or badge this year, all the fun and challenges we ran into, and reverse engineering snack machines. First challenge. First challenge. Oh. Now it's off. We're, we're dying. We've lost mics. No. Does the mic run on Cox Internet? All right. The first challenge that we have already that we have a problem is... It says three people is two now. Yeah. I'm higher on. This is crap on. Yeah. Zap's taking care of the snack machine. <laughs> so, of course, normal disclaimer. This is our fun side thing. We have employers like most people do. This does not represent our employers. But more importantly, this is a community stage. And we didn't really want to give a talk. We wanted to treat it like community discussion. When we're running our contest, tons of people want to talk to us about, hey, what was it like making the badge, working with Snacky, doing different things? And you feel bad because you want to have deep conversations about this stuff, but you're also running a contest with six, seven, eight hundred people running around and things breaking. So don't treat this as a talk. Treat it like a town hall. You know, politely interrupt us, ask questions. I will do my best to like hear and repeat it back so others can hear it and, um, group discussion but we'll we'll use the slides to go through it and anytime you, you're curious about something ask same thing oh that's good all right so we're in or um we've been making badges for about nine years um different members have come in and out but if you take a look at the picture you can see a lot of the different work we've done over the years uh and yeah we joke we make stuff drink beer no particular order we just have a wide variety of backgrounds, and we like doing this as a fun, interesting way to learn new things. And I guess that's like, hey, why do we do this to ourselves? Because you'll hear people, you know, joke about badges. What do badges do to you? What's all the stuff that's involved in it? And I don't know. For me, it's like I like learning new things. Uh, usually on a badge, sometimes we pick stuff that we don't know how to do, so we have an excuse to learn it. Yeah, I like building stuff and just seeing how... Defcon just tears it apart and make <laughs> something to survive Defcon. That's that's why I like to do. Also, just providing something that people just like to do. Give something people to do. Yeah, and I think like just teaching others. That's always been fun. Like when we do our CTF, it's usually a mixture of things. We like putting hardware hacking mostly, but we'll put reverse engineering, lock picking we've done before, just different side channel attacks and RF cryptography. Like it's it's fun to mix it up. That way it's not fully devoted to one like domain of InfoSec or something. It's just kind of spices it up. Yeah. Fun fact, if you have friends with kids and you're worried if your badge will survive DEF CON, as soon as you're done, you give your prototype to a three-year-old and let them play with it for a week. It will survive drunk hackers at DEF CON sometimes. Um, and it's good level of response, three old. So I, I would say without further ado, yeah, our badge this year plays Doom. And, uh, uh, you know, on the surface, you have a, you have a case which resembles a very recognizable, um, handheld video game device that came out 30 years ago. Um, it's very nostalgic. And uh, what would I say? We, we did everything in C. Uh, we got firmware that I'll, I'll talk about a little bit later. But yeah, it runs Doom. And if you've never messed with Doom, by the way, if you have questions about Doom later, throw them out there. Uh, at this point, we're probably 16 forks deep on the version of Doom we're using. Um, and in a nutshell, where we stood on other shoulders, we, you know, we had to put custom drivers together, rewriting of the entire control API because we do things where... Um, it's really hard to see a status bar to play Doom. So tap into that API and control the LEDs. So when you get shot, it gets bloody, the LEDs are red. When you shoot, go through ammo, you have like a status of, of ammunition going down where it's white, etc. cetera. Um, we've done some other things, making custom free open source IWAD that can be used. I'll get into that, what that hell that means, and uh, tying it into a CTF. Do we have slides for the hardware? We do have slides for the hardware. 
We have lights on us now, and it's actually more blinding, and I can't see anyone. That's okay. I appreciate it. Uh, so, yeah, if you're curious to have a question, you can, like, wave your hand on something. Um, I think I just wanted to go through, like, what's up with the hardware and what does it look like at first? Because that is where it starts to look boring. Um, you may not be able to tell when it's first put on there, but that, that's like our first rev where you just have the form factor, the buttons. You have a little, oh, of course, you can't see it. Um, our RP2040, the, the Raspberry Pi Pico microcontroller. Um, it may be too small, but I was going to ask folks, do you see what's wrong with it? I didn't even catch this problem until the final rev. Does anyone notice what's wrong on the front plate? No. Introverts. What's a... That's one. Start and select are switched. There's another one. Yeah. What's that? No. Oh, we don't have SD cards. Fuck SD cards. Yeah. Never again. We we've had a we've had a bad experience with SD cards, so we use Winbond Flash instead. Um, yeah. So it's funny. Oh, we'll go ahead. No. Everything was wrong. Then you learn there's many variants of Game Boy cases. Um, yeah. So we didn't catch that. A and B were flipped because when we were looking at the EDA design tools, depending on the point of view, you see start select B A. And it wasn't until I started working with the firmware and the control that I thought that the, the engine was just screwed up and I had to remap everything on the inside when it was really our buttons were backwards. Um, and you never want to build something into a Game Boy case. I, I think our assembly involved 19 different parts and steps and the, the shit show gets worse, but it works. It's fun. It's a nostalgic, nice hand feel to it, but it, it doesn't... You, you have to have tedious devotion to get through assembly these. It's not fun. <laughs> um, I, I honestly regret suggesting doing a Game Boy. <laughs> really? I don't Has anyone ever done Game Boy moddings? Messed them for? Yeah, it's, it's, it's a passion. Um, doesn't scale well, but we persevered and I think it's fun. Especially putting Doom. Yeah. Original the question was uh, we considered any other formats of game breaks. Um We thought about actually doing the original, the big brick, and then I, actually I think what happened was Zap basically bought the colors by accident, and we just went with that. Lots of planning, right? Yeah. We're like just roll with it. Um, and at first it was it was a nice form factor too because you're thinking about it like okay I can get cases it already holds batteries. Um, We'll get into some of the battery stuff on the later revs, but it I'll admit, as much as we complain about the cases, they're actually, it's ergonomic. It uses certain form factors. So you can only put in the parts in one way. It's super useful. Um, in hindsight, like a GBA would have given us better GPIO, especially for Doom. It, it made it a fun challenge of button combos to try to take like an eight control system and, and put it on this. Um, What's interesting is this is our first badge. We also did lithium on for our power source. Um, usually we use like three triple A's or three double A's, but because the form factor, we were limited to just two batteries. And the RP2040 is highly overclocked so that Doom runs okay-ish on it. And so it's really, really power hungry. And so we need the extra of lithium to uh, make that work. Yeah, anyone that gets them like, we had to put a, we put a weird sticker on there just saying like, you know, RTFM, don't put double A's in here. In fact, they shouldn't have to remove the batteries at all. These are lipos that are in the form factor of a double A battery. But yeah, so fully charged circuit in there. But if you put in double A's, it just won't work because they can't provide enough power. So this is kind of what like the progression looks like from a rev one to a two, three, you start seeing a yellow. Um, I know you want to talk about that. You want yeah, you want to geek about the charging circuit? Yeah, so Rev 2 and 3 was when we were trying to dial in the uh, charging circuit, make the lifting work correctly. Um, I think we were using a slightly different screen at that point, too, before we settled on what we had there uh, for production. Um, this was when I so Zap did the hardware one, and then I took over for hardware, for finishing hardware 2 and 3, and then eventually 4, which is the production version. 
have a big background in like embedded systems, but I've never used KeyCAD before. So I basically had to spend about a month and a half learning KeyCAD, another EDU tool, to basically finish up Rev 2 and then Rev 3. Um, we actually didn't have any problems with, uh, like, we didn't have any wire mods or anything like that. Everything kind of just worked. It just was trying to get it to fit in the case. Then we get a different case and it just still wouldn't fit. And then figuring out all the different revisions of cases that it had to fit into. Yeah. Okay. So there's a problem I can think of. You guys all made fun of me before. So on, you see on that previous one, I got the breadboard with the two wires and the two buttons. When you program a, a Pi Pico, you have to put it in boot select mode. Those buttons were strategically placed on the very bottom of here, um, where there is, uh, you would have an old audio jack and uh, an old DC in. It's hard to hit them and they were covered by the case. It's fine when you're designing hardware, but when you're working on flashing firmware and wads and files nonstop 100 times a day, I can't sit there with a paper clip and push them in. So I, I yanked out wires and just soldered them in so I could tap buttons to do that. Um, eventually, a fun mod, if you ever develop on a RPi 2040 or any of the Raspberry Pi microcontroller lines, because now there's multiples of them, um, you can mess with the bootloader selecting. We called it our magic mod rate. So that if you open a, a serial connection, you can set it to say, hey, if anything ever tries to connect to you at 1200 baud, we picked 1337 as our magic baud right now. But if you just hit it with 1337 on a serial terminal, it will automatically fall into boot select mode and reboot, which is wonderful if you want to, you know, speed up your tool chain when you're developing and just have a script that runs and knocks it in boot select. I bitched quite a bit. <laughs> so, and there's the final. The only difference between Rev 3 and 4 was the artwork. And we were actually just like, shit, without artwork, we were really crunching time. And I was like, no, we gotta do it. Uh, so that was the artwork um, that we did. Since they generated, we just kind of left the artifacts in there. So, like, you see, it says Doom, it says Doom. And so we just kind of left that little Easter egg in there. It was funny enough. Yeah. It's actually kind of unfortunate that you can't see, like, the clear cases aren't. Kind of cloudy, so you can't actually see how nice that silk screen actually turned out. True, yeah. I think if people had the clear PCBs, you can actually see them a lot better. Maybe the, the black ones, but purple. I grabbed a T, I was trying to go with like a Miami Vice color, cyan teal. It, it blocks the PCB altogether, maybe kind of sad, but yeah. Um, a lot happened the past couple months, a lot. Um, oh, if, questions? oh, yeah. We're full stack. Got random questions too. We'll throw them at us. So, yeah, that's my excuse. We we were looking at the slides. We're about to turn in. I was like, oh shit, we didn't finish those. But you know what? That's good enough for a slide, right? Um, when when we were talking earlier, you know, it runs Doom, and sometimes people are curious, how do you put Doom on something? You know, what is really going on when you see Doom and, and, and different types of things? And um, in general, um, you see a bunch of variants of Doom out there. You'll hear people refer to Vanilla Doom, Chocolate Doom, um, GZ Doom. You get in all these different variants. In general, uh, you know what? I, well, it's, vanilla is vanilla. It's plain. It, it, it is what it released. And chocolate built on it because you're not going to change what it released. You're you're going to keep it as close to the original port of Doom as possible, um, with with some fixes that are necessary, but not changing the original source. And what happens over time is you have all of these forks where people want to play original Doom, but they want it in triple super widescreen. Um, they don't want sprites that are from six different angles. They want 32 different angles. They, they start doing what's called limit removing because you have faster computers. So a lot of Doom engines out there and wads that are generated out there, uh, they don't work on embedded systems because they assume a lot of power horse hungry stuff. So we went with Chocolate Doom. Um, there was a variant of Chocolate Doom that uh, I believe the hacker's name was Kilogram that put it together. He pulled in a lot of fixes that came in on an, a Nordic NRF, like BMD 350 mod, where 
back in the day when you'd have Doom, Doom was very much um, not not so processor intensive, RAM intensive. And if you go through the source code and statically uh, allocate your variables, you can shift a lot of that over and shoot through it through processing, which you mentioned we doubly overclocked the Pi Pico at God, 192 megahertz. I can't even remember how many megahertz we're running at. Um, you, you're just trading processor for RAM. And so you keep building on these techniques and it makes it a really nice way to throw Doom on an embedded system. Sometimes I'm sure you see random things, people put Doom on a toothbrush, on this, on that, and it's just running the demo. Um, if you're actually trying to process a lot of other things, networking stack and, and megawatts, it gets rough. Um, so yeah, something that we saw in that, 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 that this person ran into on one of the forks we, we picked up on, you start running out of memory. And the cool thing about doing this is instead of drawing pixels, it, it's running with scan lines like you would on a normal CRT. And you only have enough memory to draw about 70, 80% of the screen. So with it doing scan line drawing, it's actually a lot more efficient to go through the, the graphics rendering. And then on the HUD, we just painted a static image on the HUD because we realized one, the screen was too small to even read it. And two, we had needed CTF challenges that actually ran on the badge. So over there, you actually see a certain hex memory address that's printed into the status bar that gets updated during the game, uh, amongst other things. So it's like we're drawing 70, 80 percent, drawing a static image, leaving it. And you go through little tricks just to keep memory going up. Um, but yeah, make sure to remember finish the, fixing the slide. I think one of the other fun things is just tapping into the API that is used to update the status bar, because if you have a badge with bling, why not update it? You know, why not turn it red when you're getting shot? It's it's a nice visual indicator for someone who's holding a badge playing Doom to see it like glowing red as you're getting lit up or or when you fire, it turns white and flashes for, for you shooting. Um, and then, you know, you just have like ammo and health kind of going up the rim on the side. Figure it's a it's a nice visual HUD. I, I don't think anyone ever paid attention to their health or their ammo count when they played Doom. They just used it till it ran out, and then okay, I'm going to switch to something else and fire on them anyway. I don't know. Any questions about firmware, Doom engines, putting Doom on stuff before we get into like the wads and whatnot? Yeah, what's up? Sorry, I can't hear. Did we use the PIOs? Um, shoot. I don't think we did. No. Womp womp. Yeah. Sorry. I will use it next year. <laughs> so I tried to make this as messy as possible, right? Um, I just remember you are talking about the blockchain and I kind of used this one. Yeah. So for the most part, it's good. Um, I think a, a couple of things I would go through is, is this. Um, there's a lot. Uh, there's a lot of modders in the Doom community, and they've made wonderful tools over the years. Some of those tools are still in use. Some of them are being migrated to bigger tools. Um, one of them that I was primarily using is Slade. Slade is really good if you are making a WAD. And I guess I should say WAD, unless people don't know, WAD stands for where's all the data. It's it's how the id team used Doom to store all of the, the core assets of their game. Those assets are referred to as lumps. But where Slade shines is you make WADs with it. You really don't want to make maps with it too much. It has a map editor, but it's not that great. Um, there's there's better tools for like Ultimate Doom Builder to, to work on maps. Um, but what you end up with is a number of things being needed to make that successful. So the core I started with was Freedom. And Freedom is free, open source, Doom replacement. I know you see a lot of people make Doom mods and put Doom on things. The Doom engine is open sourced. The IP and the graphics and the music and, and the, all those lumps that are in that Doom 1 shareware wad are not. They are copyrighted and protected. So Freedom is an open source project to, to make a community-driven Doom alternative where you can drop in the wad. 
the first problem with that is they rely on limit removing engines that use all these crazy different features and they bundle in doom doom 2 hexen so there's a lot of stuff on there that in the, in their one wad that if if you're doing this on your computer it doesn't matter but if you're putting it on an embedded system where i only have like a wind bond chip with eight megs of flash it's not going to help so we started stripping everything out changing out different sprites different assets doing our own editing um some of the old tools like converting midis to their traditional muse format only run in dos so i'm running like dos box and linux to run write my own bash scripts that's when i learned slate actually had something that did that and i felt stupid for setting up that tool chain but yeah whatever um and then using like krita and inkscape photoshop to put my different sprites together that i was creating bundle it all together bring chocolate doom into vs code seems messy goes through i think the only other reason i put the, the the meme on the side is in general you wouldn't mess with the core wad when you work on doom the way doom works is it assumes that core library of assets in the wad exist and a wad a, a wad that you're putting out is really a p wad it's considered a patch and when you put different assets in there it's literally patching it in memory and overriding those assets with a with a subset because it's an embedded system, we don't have the luxury of a file system where I can have multiple WADs on there. So if you were to look on Doom Wiki or go on some of the Doom, like the WAD creators resources, they will light you up if you're like, I'm making my own IWAD because ooh, really people should not be making their own IWAD. It's wasteful unless you have your own, you know, limited source. The end result of that is we will be open sourcing a you know a, a fork of freedom that maps um a full megawatt one two three with no other doom 2 or hex and stuff that is completely free and open source and it's slimmed down so it's great for embedded systems oh that's backwards and i pretty much mentioned that you know there's what does it look like when you when you're actually editing wads it's like a memory editor you know, it may look like a spreadsheet or a database, but if you even sort things, people sometimes forget that there's memory mappings and memory addressings. And if you just copy paste stuff in, you can you can really screw up your Doom engine and Doom game just by putting things wrong in a wad. And it makes it fun for uh, hiding things in CTFs because it's like a giant zip file. I can pad stuff in, in certain memory locations that, you know, I'm trying to get people to dump ROMs, dump, dig through the source code, dump the wads, and and, and look for things that we've hit on the side. Um, I'm about done with the wads, but I I would say the only fun I had is the uh, the most fun I had was you look at how assets are made. A lot of people will like open up Blender, you know, take a 3D model, rotate it, take slices. I wanted to make our own rubber chicken weapons and. It's kind of stupid, but you know, you got a toilet paper tube, some rubber bands and rubber chickens, record a video and then takes time slices and that turns into what I used in the game. And I have to explain to my wife why I'm like punching rubber chickens in the wall recording myself. And I'm like, it's for DEF CON, it'll make sense, trust me. Uh, you should all try this, it's actually super fun. Like I know people are like, oh, I, you know, I want to make my own Doom Wad. I'm like, take something and just record your hand punching and i don't know I, I thought it was kind of fun just to try to do my own reverse stop motion on things um without dragging it out further because we want to get to more of the snacky stuff um whether you're following us on twitter or, or hearing us gripe um we we were releasing something like yeah we fucked up um normally i'd say a different version or different way to tell what we were talking about was we're, we're usually pretty good about setting a hard date. And it's usually like, it was around when we would buy tickets for DerbyCon. It would be during the Kentucky Derby, like the first week of May, and that's when we'd submit our order. Um, we feature creeped ourselves. some things fell behind schedule, but we always had plenty of slack in times. And without going through the exhausted list, you have a couple of hurricanes hit, you have different things pop up. It kept eating into our slack. And if we hadn't feature creeped ourselves, I know those things are out of control, but um, the end result is when the big problems happen, like it went to our fab and they sent us pictures early in the morning showing that, hey, you have an eight pad thing for LEDs. 
and we have six on the LEDs. You know, you have the complete wrong part. This was the morning crowd strike happened. Try to source LEDs and overnight them to a fab when all air traffic's been grounded, except for UPS, we or USPS, we use the postal service and it gets delivered to the wrong city three hours away. So yeah, we, we've spent the better part of the past two weeks, um, 20 hour days, late at work on third shifts, in hotel rooms, in garages, um, reflowing, hot airing, hand soldering, uh, 14,000 LEDs. I think we got a pretty good deal. So the tail end of some of the badges we were vending, they had little yellow dots. We did our hardest, but I think about the last hundred or so, um, they would have one to many LEDs working. You know, some of them had like all of them, but one in the top corner, or maybe half of them were out because the thing just got cooked. And we figured it plays doom. It still blinks a little bit. People would still rather have them. Um, and if you want to get your shot at soldering LEDs, you have a whole reel that you get some. Yeah. We're, we're going to bring all our spare parts tomorrow. Like, you, if you want to do like kind of an ad hoc workshop, we'll bring all the parts, all the fill boards. We'll show them to people and be like, do you want to have your hand at assembling one of these boards, you know, assembling everything into a Game Boy case? You think you can fix it? You can have it. Try your try your best. Um, we'll, we'll do that tomorrow. Um, yeah, other than that, I, I, I pretty much summed it up after that where... Uh, Things just kept getting more saddled. What was there anything else funny that happened in that whole debacle? Self-deprecating in that sense. <laughs> like how many miles the LEDs traveled? Exactly. How many different cities they ended up having? Yeah. yeah. I know. We I wish we had the actual numbers. Because you think about it, the the they come from Taiwan, went to San Dimas, they went from San Dimas to Houston. And then from Houston to Dallas, they found out they were wrong in Dallas. And then we had to do a split order where more were coming from Taiwan and another order was coming from Sam Dimas, but it didn't go to Dallas, it went to Houston. And the one that was leaving Taiwan, there was a typhoon and they grounded all DHL. I forgot about the, the, the typhoon. Weather isn't our friend. So you're getting five international trips, then they all come back to California, then back to Houston and then driven to Las Vegas. Yeah, so They've gotten like 30,000 miles on them at least. <laughs> oh yeah, everything on that end goes through Louisville, Kentucky, and because of the tornadoes in Louisville a week and a half ago, that got shut down and things were put on hold at the district center. Yes. The big thing was, was never giving up. Was going. Yeah, you know, and I, different drift, different version of that because we're all here at the LBCC this year and whether you're you're attending as a human or you you know you volunteer as a goon or you're in a contest area or a village um there's a lot going on when you're in a new area like you know we're all trying to fill it out and learn learn the ropes and new things and every now and then you know everyone's doing different projects and contests and stuff and we all run into issues you know we had some issues with LEDs this year. We were joking about how we had such issues with SD cards in the past and, you know, people run into technical problems left and right. And that's okay. I think what, what matters is just trying to persevere through it and realize, hey, we're all human. Nothing's perfect. You know, be compassionate and, and generous towards folks and support them. And maybe you can come. We had friends that um, never used hot air before. And they're like, hell yeah, I want to learn to hot air something or reflow something. I want to take that. And, and, and I think that's awesome. Yeah, we, had, we had people that never picked up a soldering iron or anything before. We taught them how to use stuff, technology and send it in a garage. But it's, it's really like, how do you make your game like, problem pops up? Um, or is it both? Uh, this is interesting. I never want to hear that. <laughs> But it's it's, it's a good trigger. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's making the best decision at the time and making sure it's not a rash decision. So take some time, think about all the options, pick which is the best one. It might be the wrong one, 
down the road, which has happened to us lots on this appeal. Yeah, but it was at the time the best decision. You can't let, you know, looking back, you can't beat yourself up because at the time you made the best decision. Yeah. But, yeah, that's, I think that's the best way to put it. So, this is where it's more fun. Snacky. Yeah. Down. Down button. Down button. Yeah. Uh, so, our, our CTF centers are called our snap machine. Um, snacky used to be a SSI model. I think that's 3159. We barely read it without my glasses on. Uh, Redemption snack machine. And I picked it up from a Kuka shop that was closing down uh, in Houston, Texas. And uh, it had an Indian thing. It survived. <laughs> um, so the first thing was you eat the candy from the head shop and the old vending machine. Yes. <laughs> uh, you can see it's on like my like little tiny four by eight uh, trailer there. And imagine driving that down the road at six miles an hour, hitting top walls, and the little trailer is just bouncing up in the air. Um, but it's fine. Uh, so first was trying to figure out how a stack machine worked. Uh, What's interesting about stack machines or any kind of redemption technology, there's not a lot of information out there about it. The companies that build these things are very tight on what information exists. Um, you can like, be like, hey, I have an exploit on this machine. Be like, we'll see you in some light, you know, uh, take that advice. So anyways, uh, so we, we basically have to reverse engineer how this, this one particular stack machine works. Um, so the original board there, uh, it uses a bunch of custom ASICs and a microcontroller and a bunch of logic glue. And uh, the right part is the whole like power subsystem. Uh, it has a speaker on it for some reason. It never makes noise, but that's awesome. Uh, and I got to this one part of the circuit. Uh, I wish I could find this map. My idea was basically to take out the custom ASIC and plug in our own basic microcontroller subsystem. Age controls all this logic. One of the logic chips is a inverter chip. It's a eight channel inverter. And it was just into itself. And I'm like, I have no idea what that's going to do. So I was like, well, we'll go out to all the way. We've got to figure out how the motors work now. So how these motors work is they have a DC motor, a matrix, so high side and low side control. And then the, uh, they have a switch on it. You think the switch is there to let you know you rotated once. Like, feedback you have a limit switch that's not the case um they actually rotate and when it hits the switch it actually increases the amount of current it's just increases the amount of current the motor like resistor there and so the logic board is actually just looking for these cold these current pulses on the motors so we basically uh um, oh yeah so this is um i'll talk more about that motor thing but this is also like reverse engineering how the rest of the stack machine works, like how does the keypad work, how does the display work, and all that stuff. So you can see my laptop there, and it's like connected to an Arduino, and it's like kind of like zip tied to the side of the machine. Um, and then we put casters on it because moving a 800 pound machine is really hard by yourself. Um, That's the best design decision on Snacky. It was like the first thing we did. <laughs> If, if you think about taking something big and heavy to DEF CON, you don't want to drag it, put it on a pallet, or like have six people puff it around. Uh, well, because I, I had to put it on a trailer by myself. <laughs> and I was like, I, I'm not doing that. What's interesting is the, the legs that uh, the stack machine is a standard fold pattern for casters. So I was like, oh, I actually put that. Oh, yeah, so that one's that fold machine. So, uh, oh. Uh, so it has a receipt printer. This was like with us trying to figure out how to make a uh, thermal printer work. And we wanted like, this is like, we're trying to make it like more of a standalone machine. We did have a contest at the time. And so everything had to be like kiosk gray, be robust. And so we couldn't just have like a normal receipt printer just kind of like sitting off the side. We need to fill it in. And so this is a, uh, I can't remember the model, the key uh, thermal printer. But we bought it on eBay, and they had a, it was like two hundred dollars. They had to buy it now, like a offer. They offered sixty nine dollars, and they accepted it. So, uh, so here's the custom board. So after basically reverse engineering how all the peripherals in the machine works, we basically 
built this circuit board to control all that circuit, uh, all those uh, external like feeds and the uh, and the motors and the screen. And so uh, it uses two Arduino Vegas because at the time the uh, world supply chain was in crisis, and I had two Arduino Vegas in my drawer, so that's what we used. I just basically use a lot of little parts I had for more um, common functions, that kind of stuff. Um, so left side, you can see the board that we made. Uh, in the middle is like, it's called like the cache area of the machine, where like all the public points and stuff are stored. So that's where we actually put all our custom electronics. So you can see where the boards are seen. That actually uses the same part of the printer, so it's not like snapped into the original. Um, uh, <laughs> and then um, we have a big power supply we, that's the big silver box so we wanted to run lots and lots and lots of elements and then, um, we kind of modified the corner term that's our enter button we just put an arbitrary switch on that and then the right side is like right finally got the whole thing brought up um so that's kind of our uh hello world or snacky any questions so far I think the question is, it went down earlier. Is it possible to make it all self-contained? Yeah, so it's an IST machine. <laughs> so it connects to a database in the cloud, and that's how we know all the, like, all the codes are. Um, are um, so that's how it knows codes are valid or not. Um, I guess nothing can be to run that in there, but it's easier to, especially when there's some mechanical problems, it's a mechanical device to verify and that kind of stuff. It's like, like okay. Mm -hmm. I mean, it can run disconnected, but it doesn't like it. Yeah. And we, you get different then problems. Yeah, it also runs, it basically runs for like 30 seconds and it goes, oh, I lost connection to the internet. My database is not up to date anymore. So. Yeah. But that gives us a full security stack and it did not crash with CrowdStrike. Um, so this is year two. We took a lot of what we learned from the first year, which was basically, up to, well, the first year we ran on Wi-Fi. We had people de all the time. So we went to hardwire. Um, and then originally it ran on a Raspberry Pi, uh, control logic. And we switched over to just a x86 based uh, like wrapped around PC. And then put in like some nice little KVM keyboards. We actually had it all self contained. And then we added the marquee display at the top so we can display GIFs, videos, that kind of stuff, um, information about Snacky. And then we added HAL 9000 or Snacky 9000, which is our infrared and uh, Morse code style challenges. Oh yeah, so here's like the current, this is like this year's, um, we added a speaker, um, we upgraded our display to a higher resolution to be like that 1920 by 360, which is really weird to make like art assets for. Uh, it frustrates everyone in the team. So like this year, now you don't have to follow that ratio, you can just make whatever. It will letterbox or stretch or whatever, whatever it actually decides to do, focus on that image. Uh, we got we upgraded our heat um, for the thermal printer, which we actually think of downgrading now because we have people having problems scanning that QR code now. So I have to find the original source of the paper. Um, we added more LEDs, and now it has a PoE switch in it for future expansion. So we're hoping to bring like more things for our contest and hook it up to it. I like that POE. Yeah, yeah, we put a transmitter in there too for all that. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. So everything kind of add on. Everything's like a USB device, so it's really like we added a speaker. Mm. It's really easy and module how we design the software and the hardware solutions. Uh, so it's easy to add on. Uh, it probably needs a refactor now because it has like one big Python script that runs everything. Um, I probably need to fix that. Yeah. Okay. Perfect. Um, so I actually, this is 
which form should update this because we bring that batch to bring this more. Um, here is off. Uh, but you can still play the CTF right now. I should say, do you want to try and build a badge out of cannibalized parts, which may work? Come visit us tomorrow. Or just come check out Snacky, mess with it, press buttons. Yay. Yo, any questions related or not? <laughs> you have us for, I don't know, they have to tell me four more minutes? We can hang out outside too. Yeah. Okay, yeah. Oh, Jesus. So the first year we had Snappy, you have that Caesar Swarm. Um, so I was building my garage, which has one 10 volt AC. Plug in Snappy at Caesar Swarm, and it's 120 perfect. You guys are fine. Here's everything. Oh. Here's everything. Here's everything. Yeah, we'll be done. We're getting caned off stage. How about this? If you have questions, follow us right up there.